Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for the exciting opportunity to live today. We thank you, God, for the exciting opportunity to know that, God, you have called us to live courageously, yeah. without fear, with boldness. And I pray, God, today that you would instill in us the backbone of the Holy Spirit, the boldness of Christ, and God, that you would infuse us with the life that comes from the Word of God, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 I'm starting a series today called Courageous Living in a World God Man. I've had this phrase rolling around in my head for quite some time, and, and how many of you know it takes some courage to live today? Well, it takes some courage to live in any day, really, because there has never been a day on the face of the earth, except for maybe a short period of time in the Garden of Eden when there was not death and destruction and sin upon the face of the earth, that there is always evil in the world. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And so it takes courage to live in any day. Now, there are times when we're not facing uh, immediate crisis and thank God for those times, but because if we're always living in high alert, um, it, it can do something to you. But I just got to say that even when crisis comes, you and I can stand in the security of knowing that the word of God is sure and true. Amen. And that we don't have to be left wondering what in the world is going on. That's right. Even when there are things happening that we don't understand, even when in an election year when the, the news is going to dominate and make a lot of noise, even when there is all kinds of political drama and assassination attempts, Christians, even Christians who attend church are going to be pulled left and right and with news of this and news of that and, and this opinion and that opinion. But I want you to go and I want you to understand that there is a, a spirit of this age and a spirit of this world, but yet we live in a kingdom, Come on. the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus, and we don't have to live according to the spirit of Babylon. Now that's a churchy, uh, kind of like a, 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 a phrase that maybe the world would not understand, but, but, but let me explain. Let me explain what Babylon is. Babylon was an ancient nation. Yeah. But it was not just an ancient nation. It was literally a demonic spirit creating counterfeits of the kingdom of God. Right. You and I can attest to the fact that for everything that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. He's not original in anything. He's not even creative. He takes what God has already done and he creates a fake version of it. Amen? Yeah, that's right. Now you got to be careful because, I mean, let's just be honest. You can go on YouTube and you can find 150,000 million gazillion. <laughs> like those numbers? People who claim to be prophets of God. Say, oh, God told me this. This is coming in September. And this is coming in December. And oh, you better watch out. And this and that. And while some of them, there are a nugget few who really do hear from God. There are many voices that would distract you really from what God is doing. Because they're nothing more than just um, labeled Christian fortune tellers. Come on. You hear what I'm saying? Drawing people to themselves rather than to Jesus. And then there are the real fortune tellers who the only thing that they can do is discern the spirit of Satan. And they're speaking the lies of demons. And they can fortune tell what the devil has already planned to do. And, and they can predict and they can tell you things. But, but yet they are not the voice of God. And so you can hear all sorts of voices and opinions and, and predictions, but I got to tell you that the Bible speaks of a truth, the truth of the word of God. And that if you will establish your life in the truth of the word of God, you will not go wrong. But Babylon, this demonic spirit that creates counterfeits. In fact, if you go all the way to Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, calls her the mother of prostitutes, Babylon the Great, and, and talks about how she's going to fall. Yeah. 
But this same spirit has lived in every generation. The same lying, counterfeiting spirit has lived in all. I mean, you see it in Sodom and Gomorrah. You see it in Nazi Germany. You see it today in North Korea. You see it in Iran and in the cartels. Trafficking children. Trafficking drugs. Political platforms. There are political platforms right now spewing the lies of Babylon and deceit. Trying to sway you and deceive you into believing something that is not true. The media is full of the spirit of Babylon, entertainment, social media, and they all want to overtake every sphere of influence in your life so that you are listening to something that is not the spirit of God. So I want to read to you out of the book of Daniel. We're going to talk about Daniel. Chapter one and verses one and two. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Okay, so listen to this. There's a lot going on right here. The first thing that I want you to know, though, as I begin to describe what's happening in these verses is, number one, and they're in your notes, I want you to fill it out. The spirit of Babylon wants to topple you, wants to knock you over. This is happening roughly 600-ish years before Jesus. And during the time of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and possibly even Habakkuk. But we see that in this time, so many things happening. And in Isaiah 39, 6 and 7, it says, The days are coming when all that is in your house. This is Isaiah predicting what's going to happen. And that which your fathers have stored up shall be carried away to Babylon. Nothing will be left. Your own sons shall be taken away. And they will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Babylon came and toppled the kingdom of Judah. God said, if you refuse to obey me and refuse to follow me and refuse to turn away from your sin, I will turn you over to your enemy in order to wake you up. And fulfilling this very prophecy in Isaiah, we see Daniel. There's some characters in this, in this story. We see Daniel, and he's a teenager. And this book really covers roughly 69 years. He's from the time he's a teenager until he's well into his 80s. And he's a prisoner of war. He's been trafficked by the Babylonians and sold to the palace. And, and he has to take this 700 mile journey walking all the way to Babylon. And he's abused and he's hungry and he's dehydrated and he's exhausted and he's afraid. He's been taken away from his family and everything that he's known. And he's innocent and suffering. But all of this is happening because God is disciplining his children. It's a testament to us and it's a story to us that obedience to the word of God is not something that is just suggested. Come on. It is something that is required. Yeah. And it is not done in a mean way because here's the thing. God doesn't just punish for the sake of the fun of it. But God allows us to go through trials and captivities because he loves us and wants to bring us back to the heart of God. But Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we'll talk about them in just a little bit later, about their names, but, but, but they were taken as teenagers, and there's many, many others that we, we don't even know their names, and, and they were taken. And then here's the, the other character, King Jehoiakim. He's the only Jewish king in the book of Daniel, and he was a godless king. He was the 17th king, and he, he, 
He literally, and I, in Jeremiah 36, 23, you can write this down, go look at it up yourself. He burned the scriptures. He had such contempt for the scriptures that he burned them. And he was solely responsible for turning over the vessels of the temple to the captors. You see, their captors, the Babylonians, they were very superstitious. And they, they believed that in taking the vessels from the temple, that meant that their God was stronger than the God of Israel. And of course, we see the spirit of Babylon, I already mentioned it, the counterfeit of the spirit of God. And in China, it mentions Shinar, Shinar in Genesis 1, 1 and 2 is Babel. And that is modern day Iraq today. It was the number one military and economic power of the day. But it existed upon slavery. It took slaves of all of the known world and built its empire on slaves from every other nation. The spirit of Babylon is this. It's a spirit of slavery that wants to own and control everything in its path. And I speak of this today, not just metaphorically, but very, very, very precisely. This very spirit of Babylon, this demonic spirit that's operating in the world today, it wants to take us as slaves mentally and emotionally and physically. And it wants to captivate our hearts and convince us that the power of God is not strong enough, that the love of God is not strong enough. That the righteous path is not good enough. And that we can be deceived into following the spirit of the age. And then, however, there is God. Yes. God talks about, in the book of Daniel, two realms. There is the realm of the seen and the unseen. The realm of the seen is that that you see happening around you. You see the turmoil and the unrest. You see the, un the upheaval of your families. You see the drama that's happening between relationships. You see um, the things that are happening around the world. The things that you can't physically see that are happening. And you wonder what in the world's going on. Yeah. Sometimes they're unexplainable. And the unexplainable is explainable because it doesn't seem normal. But what is Kind of get wordy here, but the unexplainable is explainable because it's explainable because there is a devil in the world. Does that make sense? I hope so because I don't know if I can do that again. <laughs> but I want to tell you this there is a world of the unseen as well. The world of the unseen says that there is a God who's in control of those who are in control. God's kingdom is over every nation. God's kingdom is where we live. We are citizens first of the kingdom of God before we're citizens of any other nation. Now, I, I gotta tell you, I'm as patriotic as, as anybody. I mean, I grew up like, man, I'm willing to die for my country. I'm willing to die for the Constitution. I'm willing to give my life to protect humanity. I'm willing to protect the process. I'm willing to, willing to protect the people of my church. I'm willing to protect. I'm willing to fight. Do you hear what I'm saying? I grew up listening to Ronald Reagan. Yeah. You can't be more patriotic than that. But I gotta tell you, as patriotic as I am, I'm more committed and more faithful to the kingdom of God than the kingdom of man. Yes. Because everything that is not of the kingdom of God will fade and will pass away. Yeah. Everything, including this nation, including this land, it will all fade and pass away. But I got to tell you, there is a kingdom that stands and his king, the, this king is King Jesus and he is king of kings and Lord of lords and his kingdom will reign forever. Yes. God's kingdom is over every nation and there is a God who is in control of who is in control. Let me say this. You might hear political platitudes, you might hear plans and visions from both sides, but whoever thinks 
that they're in control, they are under the thumb of God. Yeah. That's right. God is in control. Yes. That is right. And you can say all that you want to say. We can have political debates and arguments and I'll talk all day with you. I like it. I like to talk and debate those things. But let me tell you something. Whether your side wins or loses, God is still in control. Come on. Whether your man gets the job or not, God is still in control. Yes, amen. The kingdom of God is not determined on who wins this election coming up. The kingdom of God is at hand and Jesus is here calling men to repentance. And we've got to find a place on our knees, really, where we are repentant of our sin. Broken hearted of our sin. Where, where our tears are not just tears of sorrow. Sorry we got caught. Or sorrow, sorry that we're having to deal with the consequences of our sin. But God is calling us to a place of righteousness and holiness. So that we can stand up in the strength and the anointing of God. And say, you know what, Spirit of Babylon? You're not going to come into my church. You're not going to come into my family. You're not going to come into my workplace. You're not going to come into my mind. You're not going to You're not going to make me struggle. I stand strong knowing that my my king is in control. Yes, yes. That's right. The spirit of Babylon, though, wants to topple you just like it did Israel. But you know what? The only way Israel was toppled at that point was because of their disobedience to the word of God. Yeah. The problem is they treated the word of God as optional. Come on. They treated it as unsacred. The king of Judah burned the scriptures. And while we might not literally do those things and think that we're doing those things, sometimes we do those things by practice, but not by practice, but what's the word I'm looking for? We do them. We show that we have done that in our attitude by our action and how we live. I'm not here to condemn this morning. I have no person in mind thinking of these words, but I want to motivate that God has called you men and women to a place of righteousness and a place of holiness and a place of prayer where you're not walking as a weak person, just subject to the whims of the spirit of Babylon and the enemy that wants to destroy your homes and your families, but that you are walking as a strong warrior, a man or a woman of God that can speak to the spirit of Babylon, that can speak to the demonic forces that want to destroy your lives. And you say, you know what? No. Yes. No. Come on. No. No. And the authority that's in your voice is because you know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he says, I have given you the same authority that has been given to me. And you can say no to the enemy and you can live victorious in the days to come. Yes. Amen. Amen. So the spirit of Babylon wants to topple you, but it also wants to train you. Daniel 1, 3 through 5. Go back to the scripture. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish, a god of, and of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding and learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Daniel and his friends had a high IQ and they had a high EQ as well. They knew how to relate to people. They knew how to function in high intelligence. They were handsome. They were from the royal family. But you know what the spirit of Babylon did? The spirit of Babylon took them and made them eunuchs. You know what a eunuch is? I don't want to explain it because there might be children here that I don't want don't see here hiding in a pew. But 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 look it up. <laughs> Let me put it in one more plain terms. What we see today happening even in our culture and what is being taught to the men of our culture is castrating the, the, the maleness 
of humanity and taking away the authority that God has placed in us and the boldness and the backbone to stand up for righteousness and what is right and wrong and wants to castrate us and send us our way just impotent of the power of God. The spirit of Babylon wants to take that away. And that's what it did to the, Daniel and his friends. They were made eunuchs. Never to reproduce. Never to have children. Never to go forth and be fruitful and multiply. But I want you to know this. The spirit of Babylon backfired. Because they stayed faithful. They stayed faithful. The spirit of Babylon is the reverse of evangelism. It is brainwashing. They, they sent these young men to Babylonian school and they brainwashed them. They tried. They taught them the religions of the Babylonians. They taught them demonic worship. They taught them how incantations and how to cast spells. They taught them how to think the way the Babylonians would think. But I want you to know this, that God says no way. He caused Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to have a generational rebellion against the enemy. And instead, what we see happening today in America and around the world, we have a generational rebellion against God because they've, they've, they've come across, they've come under the influence of the spirit of Babylon and they've said, you know what, we want the counterfeit instead of the real. But let me tell you something. There is also a remnant of people around the face of the earth, both young and old, who love Jesus. And they're saying, you know what? We have found power in the real. There's a power in the reality of God that says, you know what? I can trust God with my eternity. I can trust God with my sanity. I can trust God with my broken heart. I can trust God with my broken body. I can trust God with my purpose. I can trust God with my worship. And I will worship Him and Him alone. And I will remain faithful and true. Just like Daniel and his friends did in the spirit, in the, in the literal place of Babylon. When we're living under the influence of Babylon right now. You and I can stay faithful and true. And the power of God can bring Great miracles to your life. They want to train you. They want to teach you what to think instead of how to think. But Daniel and his friends chose to rebel against the enemy. When everything in front of them was tempting them to go the other way. See, thirdly, the spirit of Babylon wants to tempt you. Daniel 1, 5 through 7, the king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank, and they were educated, they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of the time, they were to stand before the king and among these were Daniel and these other names. These are we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these were their Hebrew names. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And of the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Now here's the names that he renamed them. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. He renamed them. I'm not going to go there because I've already talked about that before in another sermon, how the devil wants to rename you. But they stayed true to who they were called. They didn't allow the renaming change who they were. You see, there are three kinds of people in the book of Daniel. First of all, there were the godly people. They were tempted with comfort. They were tempted with the food. They were tempted with the delicacies. They were tempted. Uh, I mean, they were, these were teenage boys. Yeah. They could have been tempted with all kinds of power and security and everything. But, but they were godly. And they stayed faithful to God. Secondly, they're the godless. They're completely godless. All of the Babylonians. And then there's the ungodly believer, the lukewarm, 
the bachelor, the, 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 the person who just got absorbed into the culture of Babylon. I want to talk about these names, though. You see, in the education of them and the renaming of them, they tried to identify them with a counterfeit. Daniel, his name means God is my judge. Yeah. So he was renamed Belshazzar. And it comes from the idol Baal, yeah. and it means Baal protects his life. The counterfeit. Yeah. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious, but he was renamed Shadrach, meaning the command of Aku. Aku was a foreign god. It was a demonic idol. Mishael means who is what God is, meaning there's nobody like the Lord. And he was renamed Meshach, which means who is what Aku is. So instead of who is like the Lord, it was a counterfeit of who is like Aku, a demon, who is like the demon God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, maybe this is a lot to absorb this morning, but I want you to understand this. This is what's happening in our culture today. Yeah. Our culture is rejecting what's real and taking what is counterfeit. Yeah. And God wants us to remain faithful to the kingdom of God and know who is like the Lord. Yes. I'm not going to be renamed by, by culture. Yeah. I'm not going to accept the fact that they call Christian crazy. I'm, I, I just don't care. I don't care what their opinion is. I don't care what their motto is. I don't know, care what their platform is. But I am going to be faithful to my God. And I'm going to see Him move and do miracles in my life. They can all go their way. But I am going to remain faithful in the Spirit of God. You see, Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah never referred to themselves by their new name. When you read through the book of Daniel, they always call themselves by their, their own real name. Daniel, God is my judge. I will live for an audience of one. Yeah. The world can change your name, but God, only God can change your nature. Yes. And that's what I'm speaking to today is God wants to change our nature so that we don't let what others put on us get in us. Others can put things on us. They can put labels on us. They can put uh, our past on us. They can put our dis indiscretions on us. They can put our sins on us. They can label us for everything that we've done wrong. But I got to tell you this, that I am going to live for Jesus and only what he thinks matters. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And I am going to completely commit that I will not let others put a label on me because the spirit of God is what sends me to do the will of the Father. Daniel 1, 8 through 16. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. Come on. Or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has signed your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in a worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward of who the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and drink, to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and our, the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Here is laid down the spirit of Babylon versus 
the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God who sustains. And what this story is showing is that when you live according to godly principles, your life will be a life of health and blessing more than those who serve the kingdom of this world. It is the principle of Christ that when you follow him as hard as you have it, no matter what kind of tragic uh, things that you face, no matter what kind of path that you follow, no matter how hard it seems, it is still a more blessed path than the path of those who have given in to the spirit of this world. They might look like they're having fun. They might look like they're celebrating their freedom. But when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, your life will be blessed and you will be healthy and you will be rich and you will be wealthy in the spirit of God. And your life will be full compared to those who have surrendered to the spirit of this age. It's God's witness at work in you. It's God's witness. Witness at work in you when you do what is right, even when everything goes wrong. God did not promise us always miracles, but he did promise always his presence in our lives. And I wonder what the Spirit of God does in our lives as we live. Well, the first thing I know from the story of Daniel is that the Spirit of God strengthens me. The Spirit of God will strengthen you. Verse 17, as for these youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of time, when the king had commanded that they all be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters who were in all, <coughs> excuse me, of his kingdom. When you commit to God, God will strengthen you and you will surpass those who are after you. You will surpass those who do not have the presence of God upon them life, their lives. How does this happen? I, I, I got to tell you, I have it supernaturally, but it will play out in the physical. Yeah. You might be in a business or in a company and the blessing of God comes upon you and you get promotions and you get opportunities and you get favor when other people do not because you are serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yeah. You're living a kingdom life, not a, a life of Babylon. The Spirit of God will strengthen you and give you favor. And no matter what you do, you will find that God's Spirit is with you. You need the Spirit of God in you and godly friends around you, just like Daniel and Hananiah and Michelle and Micah. You see, he found them ten times, not just a, a little bit better, but ten times better than all of the fake ones, than all of the magicians, than all of the enchanters, than all of the people who get themselves over to the kingdom of Babylon. Just like Jesus, they grew in wisdom and stature and favor as young men, but it was by the Spirit of God. That's what's so cool. It's by the Spirit of God. It's not through your own strength and understanding. It's by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So God will strengthen you, but God will also sustain you. Verse 21, and Daniel, there was until, and Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. He was there until his 80s. He lived 69 years in Babylon in captivity and outlived the Babylonian empire. He lived through 13 kings, 14 kingdoms, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, to his hand. And God gave Daniel favor. And God gave him learning and skill. In all of these verses that we've just gone through, he, God, the Spirit of God, sustained them. Right. How do I know he's going to sustain you? John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that who believes in him should not, what? Perish. Perish but have eternal life. 
You don't have to perish. You can have eternal life. But you know what? Eternal life doesn't begin the moment you die. Your eternal life begins the moment you trust Jesus as your Savior. Right. Kingdom living is not just about going to God's kingdom in heaven. The kingdom of God can live in your hearts. Now let me be clear. I'm just going to put a little caveat here. There's this theology that goes around and some, some people uh, espouse it today called kingdom now theology. That says that we are God's representatives and we're called to bring God's kingdom into fruition in this earth and build it through all of the spheres of influence, through politics, through religion, through um, education, through um, business, all these kinds of things. And we're supposed to establish the kingdom of God. And I got to tell you, there's no way that you and I can do that. Right. There's no way you and I can do that. We are not going to rid the earth of evil. We're not going to set up God's kingdom for him and rid the earth of evil and set up this amazing place. The world's going to grow darker and darker as the light of the gospel grows lighter and lighter. Mm -hmm. But the kingdom of God, God does exist in all of those realms because God has called us to occupy until he comes. He's called us to stand for righteousness until he comes. He's called us to live a life of righteousness in our families. And you, when everyone else's family is breaking apart and falling apart, your family is going to stay together and stay whole because you are trusting Jesus and living for Jesus and his blessing is upon your home. His blessing can be upon your finances. His blessing can be upon your education. His blessing can be upon your business. We're going to live and we're going to occupy and we're going to thrive in this place until he comes. Amen? Amen. We're going to do the bidding of the king in the kingdom of God until he comes. But only Jesus can set up his kingdom. And that will happen when he comes back to this earth and he sets up his throne on the mount uh, in, in Jerusalem. And he will finally and forever take uh, his kingship over this earth and he will rule and reign forever. But I got to tell you, until then, he lives in us and through us and the kingdom of God exists because of us. And he wants to bless you in all things. But it takes us identifying and knowing who is the king of this kingdom. The Spirit of God will strengthen you. The Spirit of God will sustain you. The Spirit of God will also send you. I'm getting out of order here, so I'm sorry up there. That the Spirit of God sent Daniel and his friends. If I go back to verse 8, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. I know I already read this, but we need some people in the kingdom of God that have resolved themselves that we won't defile ourselves yeah. with the way the, the way the world is. That's right. I'm not talking about personal choice items. I'm talking about we're not going to fall into sin, deep sin. You see, th there's a difference between, um, oh, I made a mistake and I sinned, and I'm living in sin. A lifestyle of sin. Yeah. A lifestyle of sin. There's a difference. I can live a lifestyle of sin, but that's by choice because God's empowered me. To not live a lifestyle of sin. But it's not just a vague thing of sin. This is like God's called us to say, you know what? Even when it hurts, I'm going to tell the truth. Even when it hurts, I'm going to stand against the spirit of the world. Even when it hurts, I'm not going to let the spirit of the age come and take over my schools. Even when it hurts, I'm not going to let the influence of the spirit of Babylon come into my home through social media and movies and, and all these kinds of things. Now, I'm not preaching to you to tell you what movie to watch and not watch. Please hear my heart. Do you hear my heart today? I'm not telling you what to do, like which one to pick. I'm saying we need a, a, 
we need a righteous anger to rise up within us and say, you know what, enough is enough and I'm not going to allow the devil to tell me how to think anymore. I'm not going to allow the government to tell me how to think anymore. I'm not going to allow my neighbor to tell me how to think anymore. I'm not even going to allow my friends to tell me how to think anymore. I'm going to turn to God and I'm going to live a righteous life and I'm going to stand up and I'm going to refuse to defile myself with the spirit of the age, just like Daniel. And that will cause me to be anointed to be sent by God to be an influence in the midst of the darkness. Yeah. We'll find later that Daniel, much later, when he was very old even, was thrown into the pit of the lions. You see, the devil won't like it when you stand up for righteousness. That's right. The devil won't like it when you do what is right instead of what is wrong. And you might be thinking, well, woe is me. Why would somebody be mean to me? Well, let me tell you this. You should be excited to know that no matter what happens to you, you are a partner in the persecution of Jesus. And you can celebrate and be excited that if someone doesn't like how you're living, that you're doing it right. Yeah. But God will be even right. in trouble. That's right. Would you stand with me today?